Welcome back. It's now time to go in depth. Regional airline Liat has been in the news a lot lately. Issues ranging from broken wheels and passenger complaints to a beef with competitor Caribbean Airlines over subsidized fuel. Now here to clear the air on some of these issues is CEO of Liat, Captain Ian Brunton. Welcome, Captain. Hi, Kalila. Yes, so there are many things to talk about where Liat is concerned and we want to start with the refleeting exercise and you're just about to get into that. Liat is getting some new planes but still experiencing challenges and just recently one of the new planes was grounded for almost a week. What's behind these problems and have they finally been resolved? Well, yeah, the um, refleeting exercise, as you know, was decided on the ATR, was chosen back in about the 21st of July when the board and, and shareholders decided to accept the recommendation of the um, management at the time. And shortly after that, it was announced, if you remember, by the Prime Minister of St. Vincent, the chairman of the shareholders of the act, announced that the ATR is a chosen aircraft. Then I came on the 1st of August and we started to implement that decision as soon as we could after that. Uh, we engaged the chosen manufacturer and lessors because obviously you can't afford to purchase all the aircraft that you want. It's, uh, the upfront capital needs are far too much for an airline of our size. So we were going in roughly looking at um, just under half purchase and a bit more on operating leases. And those um, negotiations went all the way through from August to around about December where we started to firm up and when we saw where we were getting the initial deposit funding from the extra equity to be put in by the government shareholders. So the first signatures on sales agreements and so on happened around about January, February, March, April, the leases of wealth. And the first aircraft were to come in in June, July, and August. We were supposed to have, in fact, five by the end of August, some on leases, some uh, owned ones. However, the first setback were the delays caused by problems A, at the factory in France, the ATR factory, caused really by the very high demand for this airplane in the world. Uh, people are ordering at the rate of 20, 30 airplanes at once, and places like Avianca Taka, Venezuela as well, and so on. Of course, a huge demand on the order book of ATR, and that has caused, unfortunately, delays in the suppliers to ATR, and therefore delays on the um, production of the airplane. So instead of having two at the start of our summer, we only had one. And throughout the summer, instead of getting the four or five we needed, we've only had two throughout the entire July and August. Of course, that sets us back. The major setback is that we don't have the extra lift. But then we had to invoke a contingency to go back to using the old Dash 8s. As soon as you do that, you bring in the risk of the Dash 8s breaking down as they always have. Those Dash 8s are between 23, coming up now on 24 years old, the older ones. It's a huge challenge to keep an airplane of that age reliably in the air for good on-time performance and reliability. So was it one of the older Dash 8 planes that had the problem or the new ATR planes? The, the, the dash eight. Problem with the wheel as well? Yeah, it was, was one of the problems, and that is a known problem with the dash eight, that the bearing, there's a failure on uh, one of the wheel bearings, and when that happens, unfortunately, quite often a wheel is shed. It's, it's something, I don't want to say it's normal, but it's happened a lot in the industry, and we, it's happened to us before we're used to it. So there's, there's no big deal in the sense that there's no massive emergency. It's just that, you know, the airplane is grounded until we fix it. It's fixed now and it'll be flying out of Barbados shortly. So bottom line, Captain Brunton, can passengers feel safe on Liat? Of course they can. Liat has an outstanding safety record, probably one of the best in the world. I'm knocking wood here because that is something that you have to, and it's almost like a marriage, you work on it day by day in order to keep it going. And our safety record has been kept going since 1956 when we started off. So yes, passengers can feel very safe. The challenge is that it takes long to get those airplanes serviceable and airworthy that we can feel safe to put them in the air. They often break down and we have to fix them. A lot of the stuff is discretionary, but we make sure that we do the extra maintenance in order to, that we can feel comfortable that then when the aircraft gets in the air, it's fully, fully airworthy. 
So I understand, as you've been saying, that there are several new planes, additional planes that will be coming on stream shortly. So does this mean that you will be expanding your service by maybe adding more flights or more destinations? I'm sure that Liat passengers and customers would want to go to different places and, and persons from different countries also could experience the Liat experience. That is the, the idea. We published in October of last year. We started working on a business plan around about August and published it in October of last year to all our stakeholders and the press. And we revised it in January of 2013 of this year. And there'll be another revision as things are obviously very dynamic in this business. And so the business plan is being modified as we go forward. That business plan does call for the core network to be improved with a better product, the uh, ATR 42 and 72, which any, if any Anybody has traveled on it. We now have um, quite a few passengers who've traveled on it, and the feedback is extremely good. They're overawed by the different experience. But also, we have in the business plan an expanded network, which takes in quite a few new destinations, and we'll be rolling those out next year. So what are some of the destinations that Liat is considering expanding to? Uh, destinations such as Aruba, uh, another destination in uh, the Dominican Republic, Punta Cana. We're also looking at Haiti. We're looking at Cuba. And we're even looking as far afield eventually as Jamaica, where you're based at the moment. Well, so that's the Northern Caribbean and venturing out into the Greater Antilles. Now, moving on to another topic of concern, when it comes to regional transportation, that's become a hot topic at the regional level and at the CARICOM level has been discussed at many of the heads of government meetings. The Caribbean is probably one of the most expensive places to travel by air. Why is that? Well, it really is a matter of economies of scale. This is a very expensive part of the world for aviation, mainly because the throughput is so low, the volume is so low. If you stand in any of the metropolitan airfields, New York, Chicago, here, or anywhere in Europe, you will see the millions of passengers that go through on a daily basis. If you stand in one of the airports in the Caribbean, I defy anyone to see much movement except Liat throughout the day. There are banks of some of the foreign air carriers that come in, two or three of them throughout the day. In the, but places like Grenada, you know, even Barbados and these places, you find very little heavy volume traffic, which means that the throughput through our airports is so low that you don't get the economies of scale of being able to pay for the very expensive infrastructure that aviation demand. It's both the infrastructure towards safe air navigation, the tarmac and concrete and runways that cost a lot to maintain, but more nowadays it's the cost of security. Since 9-11, security costs go up layer by layer just about every month. Whenever there's a little incident in any part of the world, we sneeze. We have to take in all those costs. And therefore, the cost to the governments of aviation infrastructure is so much that the only way they can um, attend to that cost is by charging the people who travel. And that is why you find that government fees and taxes in this part of the world, on average, if you average both of them, about 67% more than anywhere else in terms of the metropolitan areas. IATA did some benchmark studies in 2008 and found that these figures, that the government fees and taxes were about 73% more than the benchmark route, and the fees for airports were about 62%. So that's why I say an average of about 67% or so more than uh, the metropolitan routes, and that is why I have comparable routes. Oh, but then I haven't heard Liat or any of the other airlines lobbying to bring these costs down. Oh, you haven't been listening then, because we have been lobbying very much. We talk about it all the time, but every time we air the discussions on fees and taxes, that is what we do. We've been saying to them, let us try, and it's not just us, it's the non-governmental organizations like the CTO and so on have been saying the same thing. Let us try and stimulate demand and not stifle demand. Let us try and bring down the fees and taxes, increase the volumes, and therefore increase the revenue that way. We're working on all of them, and, and it's just a matter of time for you know these pressure groups can have some effect on the government. Now, you are also the CEO of Caribbean Airlines for a little over a year. Which one is more difficult to manage, Liat or Cal? Oh, definitely Liat. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> oh, I'll need uh, a couple of hours to explain that. But no, Liat is very difficult because Liat 
When I managed the airline in Trinidad, we had a clean balance sheet, no debt, with enough working capital, and the airline had um, you know, about 169 million US dollars in cash in the war chest. It's easy to manage an airline like that. My, things have changed there, but that's another story. But when I was there, we had everything going for us. So it was relatively easy to look ahead, do the strategic things, because you won't bog down fighting continuous fires, trying to find money for working capital, to pay salaries and so on. That's the kind of problem I have to face here, which is extremely stressful, of course, for, for our management and for myself. So, so yeah, there's, there's no question it was much easier to run Cal than, than Liat. So would you say that financing is Liat's biggest challenge then? Yes, Liat has always been undercapitalized and therefore under-resourced. It's a struggle to find capital to keep the airline going. And with an accumulated deficit of well over 350 million EC dollars now, makes it that, that's a, a sort of a strangling weight around your neck. So it's extremely difficult to make ends meet in a, in a company like Liat. But we're working on it, and with the game-changer airplanes that we're getting and the game-changing culture change that we are working on with our partners in the industry, we think we will um, get over the hump within a year or so. I saw in the news recently where trade union leader Chester Humphrey from TAWU called on more regional governments to become shareholders in Liat. Would you welcome that? Absolutely. We've been saying that all along, in public as well as in private. Those countries in the region who gain so much from LIAT, because no other airline would do what we do. That's why people say we have a monopoly. It's only a monopoly because other airlines have tried and failed, and others are afraid to come in. The barrier to entry is not LIAT, really. The barrier to entry is the high cost in this region and the lack of support for the airlines, the lack of financial support. Normally, when you have this kind of situation where there are high demand on airline services, but with low returns on those services because they're very thin routes with a very few population. Normally, what results from that is subsidies. That's all over the world this happens. There are subsidies given to the airline in order to fly what we call a sort of social essential routes. This happens at all levels in places like the United States where you have municipal support, state support, and federal support for that kind of activity. But it's very difficult to get that, mainly because I suppose the governments are in financial distress in this part of the world and can't afford it, but they still make huge demands on us. When we start pulling down flights to make our schedule more efficient and to try and be more cost-effective, less of a drain on the treasuries of the three or four shareholder governments and taxpayers when we try to do that, there are massive screams from the governments about we must put back on the flights because their people are being distressed because they can't get to this place to get a visa in time and to do this and to do that and to make connections with the international carriers and so on. And they're saying that and at the same time they will not not, a lot of these governments do not invest in LIAT. Obviously, it's because they don't have the cash, but really it's a question of they have to find the cash if they want the air travel. They have to find some way of either paying for those individual routes and or investing in LIAT so that we can become more efficient and perhaps even bring down our prices if we could be more, much more cost effective in our operations. And indeed, you mentioned the word subsidy, which brings me to something else that I want to ask you about. But we have to stick a pin in that for right now because we are out of time. So I'm going to ask you to join us again on Thursday. And we had discussed this earlier to continue this conversation. So I definitely want to thank Captain Brunton for joining us this evening. That's Captain Ian Brunton, CEO of Liat Airlines. And later on or after the break, we go in. Uh, it's time for sports, actually, not in depth.